It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning the things we know. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. I received a message from GEM, Grace Evangelistic Ministries, from Moses Onwabiko's helper, Debbie Hagar. And it's, uh, she received a, an, an email. Dear Prayer Supporters, Imagine my surprise when I received a mail last month that began, Greetings in the name of Allah. The email started out like this, Dear Friend, Greetings in the name of Allah. I am a Muslim living in Cameroon, and Pastor Cha Joseph of the Grace Church has been talking to us recently about Jesus Christ. He gave me your address, and asked me to contact you so you could tell the story of Jesus Christ better. After sending some materials and a few emails and many verses later, I received this mail yesterday with great joy. What a reminder of the great sacrifice many people make to become Christians. Her tale paints a vivid picture. My dearest in Christ, this is the letter from the former Muslim, my dearest in Christ, this morning, after my Bible study session with Pastor Cha, I finally trusted Christ as my Savior as I put my faith in Him. Actually, this was only a declaration because I had taken this decision some days back but was reluctant to declare it because of pressures from my family. But I have made up my mind as I can't hide my feelings anymore. Now I am in great difficulty as I have been refused all amenities and rights in our home. Pastor Cha is the one helping me at the moment for food and other things, but things are also very difficult for him. I am a mother of three, two girls and one boy. My parents forced me into early marriage when I was 14 years old. I lived with my husband far away from home for three years and had my first daughter, but decided to leave him when he married another wife. I was then forced into another marriage in which I had two children. Then I discovered that my husband was having an affair with my best friend. Later he decided to marry her. And so I left him in total frustration, not without great assault. It is very difficult bringing these children up as a single parent. All this while my sisters and brothers and cousins have been helping in the education of these children, and now they have vowed not to have anything to do with them because of my decision to become a Christian. I don't regret it, but trust that God will lead me through. I am encouraged by Pastor Cha's courage and assurance and peace of mind even when he is in problems because right now he has a lot of health problems in his home but he seems not to be worried at all. All I care for now is that I have Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I am frustrated with life as a Muslim. Every day you are forced to do one thing or another against your wish. I have just learned of the liberty in Christ and my Christian friends are bringing a lot of comfort to my heart. Please continue to pray for me in my situation. I am not well educated as I had only elementary education and it is difficult for me to get a job here with the very high rate of an unemployment with many qualified and educated people around. Please continue to pray for me and for some of my friends who also want to become Christians but are afraid that they will not be bold enough to take the decision. 
My greetings to your husband and all your friends for me. Once again, I am thankful to you for writing and to God who has opened my eyes to see this great light. May God continue to bless you and give to you many more days. By God's grace, I hope to become a great woman of God, your friend. And then the, that's what's happening in the Muslim world. In fact, Africa is split about half Muslim, half Christian, and then there's a bunch of uh, tribal religions over there as well. But you see the difficulty they have in other countries while we have the freedom, courtesy of the United States military, to assemble ourselves together without any threat of harm, at least up until this point. So let's turn to Galatians 4.7. Galatians 4.7. Galatians 4.7 describes the airship and we will study the doctrine of airship today and that's probably about all we'll get through. 4.7 talks about the result of adoption. So you are no longer a slave but an adult son. And since you are an adult son then you are an heir of God through the instrumentality of Christ. So since you're an heir of God, brings up the doctrine of heirship. And this doctrine deals with the various categories in which God has provided for us in grace and inheritance for both time and eternity. Are you having difficulty hearing? Can you hear me? So let's look at 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, which deals with the doctrine of inheritance for both time and eternity. And this doctrine deals with the various categories in which grace has been provided. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the basis of His great mercy gave us a new birth, spiritual birth, the operative word is birth. Spiritual life begins at birth. Into a living confidence in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, resulting in an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, having been guarded in heaven for you, who are constantly protected by the power of God through faith. That is, faith rest and a personal sense of destiny resulting in deliverance to be revealed. The deliverance to be revealed is resurrection. Once you believe in Christ, you're delivered, but the deliverance to be revealed is when we all receive our resurrection body, whenever that occurs, resulting in deliverance to be revealed like an unveiled bride in the last time. The last time is the second advent. So the basis of our airship in the royal family. There's the basis of our airship. Airship is based on sonship. Point one, airship is based on sonship. You must be a son before you can become an heir. And when you believe in Christ, you become huios, not technon, but huios, an adult son, in which you've become an heir. In Galatians 4.1, technon means a son under authority, and we've noted that. But huios means you are an adult son. You've put on the toga virilis. Now you're an adult son. Say, in John 1.10-12, it says he was in the world as the incarnate Christ, and he created the world, but the world did not recognize him. Then in verse 11, he came to what was his own, but his own people did not receive him. That is, the Jews did not receive him. Then in verse 12, but to all who have received him, the verb means that you've received a gift, faith alone in Christ alone, results in you receiving a gift, but to all of you who have received him, those who believe in his name, he has given the authority to become the sons of God. Again, here we have huios, meaning adult sons. 
Let's look now at Romans 8, verse 16. 8, verse 16 and 17. Also dealing with the basis of our heirship in the royal family. Why are we heirs? What makes us heirs? Faith alone and Christ alone. And we are heirs in that we share the most phenomenal assets ever. We share eternal life. We share righteousness. Romans 8, 16 through 17. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. When you believe in Christ, you become a child of God, then an heir of God. And if children, then heirs. Namely, heirs of God and also fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him, so we may also be glorified with Him. And this new believer in Africa who is undergoing persecution is suffering, as it were, with Christ because now she is in Christ. And if indeed we suffer with Him, so we may also be glorified with Him. If we're not in the royal family of God, then how can we be an heir of God? So you must enter the family of God in order to be an heir. You must have faith in Christ. And the Lord is heir of all things and we share in all that he has. Now heirship is based on the death of another. And usually when someone dies in our family and they, they, they will leave a will and also usually leave money, property, estate, etc. behind. So heirship is based on the death of another. Romans 5.8 describes this. Romans 5.8 describes the heirship of another based on death. And Jesus Christ died as a substitute for us. As a result, we can become his heirs. And all of this is very important and very wonderful. So to enter the family of God, you must have faith alone in Christ alone. And the Lord is heir of all things, and therefore we share in all things. Romans 5 eight. But God demonstrates His very own love for us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died spiritually as a substitute for us. Therefore, heirship of the royal family is based on a new covenant. The new covenant faith alone in Christ alone, also found in Hebrews 9.15. We'll be going over several different verses. You can look at them with me or just write the verse down and look later, whichever one you wish. So Hebrews 9.15. Hebrews 9.15. And so He is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the eternal inheritance he has promised since he died to set them free from the violations committed under the first covenant. What violations? Violations of the Mosaic law. Remember the law curses. And we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Now 9.16 For where there is a will, the death of the one who made it must be proven. And that makes sense. It's the same today. When someone makes a will, that will is carried out. And usually families squabble over it, but they shouldn't. Whatever the will says is what it says, and that's the way it should be. And uh, maybe one uh, person was a favorite, so the father gives to the favorite more than to the one that wasn't so favorite. So what? It was his will. Where's all the bickering? From the old sin nature and jealousy. I'd rather not have a dime than to have to bicker and all that junk. But for where there is a will, the death of the one who made it must be proven. So to inherit from God, one must possess the life of God, and that means one must have eternal life. 1 John 5:11 through 12 mentions that. 1 John 5:11 through 12. 5:11. And this is the record. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. In verse 5.12, the one who has the Son has this eternal life. The one who does not have the Son does not have eternal life. 
part of our inheritance is eternal life and eternal security. You see, when uh, Jesus Christ made this will for us, and the will was you believe in Jesus Christ and you will have eternal life, when He made that will, that will cannot be undone. And that also means eternal security. And God will not change His will just because you've been a bad little girl or a bad little boy. You believed in Christ, you, you now receive the inheritance, and since He's already spiritually dead and has once and for all died on our behalf, it would be as if believing your relative would come back from the dead and say, I heard you talking bad about me. Give me everything in my will back. It won't happen. Neither will it happen with you. No matter how you act, you're in this inheritance. And no matter what you do, it's not a license for you to go crazy, but if you do, you still have that inheritance. So to be an heir of God, you must have His perfect righteousness and His eternal life. And you receive that through faith alone in Christ alone. All of the heirs of God have been justified by grace via imputed perfect righteousness from the justice of God. When you believe in Christ, you receive plus R. Your righteousness matches up with God's righteousness. Therefore, you're approved. So salvation adjustment to the justice of God is the qualification for this inheritance. Now the believer has the greatest possibility for a greater grace heritage in time. What we've been talking about is our heirship in the royal family and this is what we all have. Winner or loser, we have eternal life. Winner or loser, we have plus R. You can believe in Christ and, and be a terrible murderer. You still have the inheritance. So the believer has the possibility for a greater grace heritage in time. First of all, the believer has perfect righteousness from the justice of God. And in order for the believer to advance to maturity and receive blessing in time, he must develop capacity. And this is where we get the Greek word dikaiosune. Dikaiosune is actually referring to experiential righteousness. It's referring to your life inside your spiritual life. Capacity comes only from learning the Word of God. This is part of your inheritance. You're given the ability to learn the Word of God. And this blessing that you receive is not merely material blessing. All believers receive material blessing. And just because you go to maturity doesn't mean the material blessing will get greater and greater. You may be a blessing by association to someone else, but as for you, just because you get to maturity, as so many other people say, you do not, that does not mean automatic blessing in terms of wealth. You will not receive all of this wealth that you've always wanted. Why? Because your definition of what makes you happy will change. And what will make you happy is not a new car, not a new house, not a swimming pool, none of those things. What will make you happy is capacity righteousness from Bible doctrine, knowing Bible doctrine. And just like Paul, whether rich or poor, he was happy. Whether he was hungry or full, he was happy. So this blessing is not referring to material blessing. It is referring to a spiritual blessing that only a few believers ever even begin to understand exists. And this spiritual blessing is far greater than money, far greater than the details of life. This spiritual blessing is something that will bring you tranquility of soul. Would you want to be rich and not have tranquility of soul? Or would you rather be poor and have tranquility of soul? I'll tell you what. I'd rather be scraping through a, a trash bin looking for food and have tranquility of soul than to have a million dollars and be miserable. So it's referring to far greater blessing than any material blessing you desire. So perfect righteousness is related to doctrine. And through this, there must be a balance of the filling of the Holy Spirit along with metabolized doctrine in your soul. That means you must operate under Operation Z, the two power options. And this is how you eventually attain the greater blessings for time. When you believe in Christ, you become an heir. But when you execute the unique spiritual life, 
You're given blessings above and beyond what you could ever ask or think. The believer has an inheritance at the po- an inheritance at the point of salvation and an even greater inheritance for eternity as we just noted in 1 Peter 1, 3-5. The heirship of the royal family, that is us, is related to the doctrine of the divine decrees. You might not remember that. We'll have to go over it again at some point. We studied it in essentials. But it is related to the doctrine of the divine decrees. And according to Ephesians 1, 11, God actually knows how far you will advance in your spiritual life before you were even born. Let's look at Ephesians 1.11. According to Ephesians 1.11, God knows in eternity past, He already knows how far you're going to advance in this spiritual life. I don't know how far I'll go. You don't know how far you'll go. I definitely don't know how far you'll go. But God the Father knew in eternity past exactly how far you would take this unique spiritual life. Ephesians 1.11 By whom? Jesus Christ. By whom? Jesus Christ. We also have received in eternity past an inheritance allotment. By whom we also have received an inheritance allotment. We've already received it in eternity past. And this is why it says having been predestined for the purpose of a predetermined plan. So it's already been predestined. Now what you must understand about predestination, and if you had gone with me through the doctrine of the divine decrees, you would understand this. This predestination doesn't mean that God has already programmed you to go as far as you're going to go in the spiritual life. It means God knows how far you will take your own volition. He already knows what choices you will make. He already knows whether you'll be positive. He already knows whether you'll be negative. He already knows whether you'll go to play Roma or whether you'll go to maturity or whether you'll remain a child or or whether you'll go and revert into reversionism and become a spiritual moron. He knows all of that. He hasn't predestined you in that he hasn't programmed you to do that. You still have volition right now to go as far as you want. But God knows exactly how far you're going to go already. So having been predestined for the purpose of a predetermined plan, for the author of the plan who works all things in conformity with the purpose of his will, and he works all things in conformity to the purpose of his will so that he might be glorified. What this means is no matter what you do, no matter how you fail in this spiritual life, God's already predetermined that he will be glorified in every way. It's another way of saying, you think you can upset God, you're an arrogant SOB. You cannot upset God. And you cannot hold back glory from God. God's already arranged it to where he's going to be glorified no matter what you do. What it's saying is God's flying this F-16 and you, and you can either hop on for the ride or you can stay down below and watch it fly by. Either way, that plane's going to fly by. You've just got to make sure whether you want to go along for the ride or not. And if you don't go along for the ride, it's not going to upset him one bit. He's the pilot. You think it upsets a pilot uh, who's flying uh, a 747 across country? If you as a passenger hop on or not, doesn't upset him. You've already paid the ticket. If you didn't arrive, so what? He's going to take off and he's not going to have one thought about you on the earth waving at the plane as it streaks across the sky. So you can't insult God. You can't stop God. He's already ordained it in eternity past that he's already glorified. And the arrogance of people who think they upset God because of what they've done or because they've made a mistake. The arrogance of people who have gone out and committed adultery and then thought that somehow God now is upset with them. Oh, their husband or wife will be very upset if they find out. But God won't be. He's not upset. Now you better rebound or you'll be punished. But he's not upset. That's what it means. He's already conformed everything in this world for the purpose of his will, meaning he's already been glorified. Now it's up to you. Do you want to hop on that plane or stay on the earth and just wave at it? And it's your choice. 
And God already knows the choice you're going to make. And God has already predetermined whether your life will be one of punishment or one of blessing. And the choice is always yours. So God will pour out spiritual blessings upon you if you are positive and you follow with daily reception, retention, and recall of the Word of God. There you will receive spiritual blessings. And eventually you will develop what is called reciprocity in which God loved you and as a result you love God. Remember the only reason you love is because God loved you first. There's even a song about that. So therefore, when you respond to the love of God, it is through the concept of reciprocity, and you will be tested. And without the testing of the doctrine that you know, you would not get the blessing. We've noted that before. And under the concept of God's will, and under the concept of the inheritance, you must be tested. And part of your inheritance is a testing. And an evangelist will say, you believe in Christ and you'll be happy forever. You'll be happy forever in eternity, but not on the earth. And what you need to do is grow in grace and in knowledge, and then you'll be tested. You may fail the test, you may pass the test, but you're going to be tested. Providential preventative suffering. Momentum testing in four categories. Evidence testing if you go to play Roma. You're going to be tested. And without the testing, there will be no blessing. So testing, in effect, is part of your inheritance. So when you have an inheritance that God has provided for you in eternity past, your job now is to concentrate on doctrine and not worry about the blessings or when you will receive these blessings. These spiritual blessings will come naturally the more you grow in grace and in knowledge. And this tranquility will increase the more you grow in grace and in knowledge. If you don't have a tranquil life right now, it's because you haven't made it yet. Keep plugging, keep plugging, keep plugging. And don't worry when you'll receive the tranquility. And don't try to fake the tranquility. These things you cannot fake. And these things will come once you receive a capacity for Dikaiosune. And your capacity for these spiritual blessings will be what right now you would consider these spiritual blessings beyond what you could ever ask or think. That's why the Bible describes it as you will receive blessings beyond what you could ever ask or think because he was writing to people who had not yet made it all the way. But once you make it all the way, you'll understand them. But you will not understand the blessings to come in eternity. But once you get to heaven, you will. So your capacity for these spiritual blessings which right now are beyond what you could ever ask or think, once you have consistency by being filled with God the Holy Spirit and taking in the Word of God and using the two power options, the spiritual blessings will begin to flow in. Don't expect you'll win the lottery just because you've been listening to doctrine. Don't expect that you'll get a promotion at work just because you've been listening to doctrine. You may get a promotion you very unlikely may win the lottery, very unlikely. But e either way, if you do, if you uh, continue in growing in grace and in knowledge, guess what? You won't care if you get the promotion or win the lottery or have all that money you've always wanted or have that nice house you've always wanted or drive that Cadillac Escalade that I've always wanted. You won't care. You just won't care. Why? Because you'll have the spiritual blessing. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is actually a down parent, a payment and is a guarantee to the existence of the inheritance of the royal family. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you receive the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, and that's actually a down payment. And it's a guarantee because you're sealed with God, the Holy Spirit. It's a guarantee you will receive your resurrection body. It's part of your inheritance. And whether you're a winner or a loser you will receive your, in your resurrection body. Whether you walk out on doctrine and never come back, you're going to receive your resurrection body. And that's because the indwelling of the Spirit is the guarantee that you will receive it. Now, if you do not execute the spiritual life, you will receive a resurrection body as it were coming through flames as we've noted. So let's look at Ephesians 1.13-14. 
we saw Ephesians 1.11. Let's now look at Ephesians 1.13 through 14. By whom you all trusted, after you understood common grace. By whom you all trusted, after you had understood common grace, the message of truth the gospel of your salvation. Uh, you know what common grace is by now. I hope you do. Under common grace, God the Holy Spirit makes the gospel available to you and understandable to you. That's common grace. Efficacious grace. You believe in Christ and He makes it effective for salvation. By whom you all trusted after you understood common grace, the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, after when you believed, were sealed by means of the Holy Spirit with the guarantee of promise. You're given a guarantee. You're sealed. And if you're sealed by God the Holy Spirit, you're sealed. And to think you can break the seal of God the Holy Spirit is ultimate arrogance. You're going to break the seal of God. You know, if you tried to break the seal of a king in the olden days, for example, they would send a letter somewhere, a private letter, that they didn't want anyone else to read except the person receiving it, so they would put a seal on it. And it would be and if anybody broke that seal, that person would be executed. And you think you can break the seal of God the Holy Spirit who has sealed you until the day of redemption? You better not think that, or you are in total arrogance. That what it means is if you don't believe in eternal security, you are the most fat-headed, arrogant person on the face of the planet. And there are a lot of them who believe they can do something to break the seal of God. How insane and how insanely arrogant to think you can break the seal of God. But they're all out there and they make me sick. This is why the Apostle Paul is so tough in Galatians. He's saying, you people gone off your rocker. You have gone into such arrogance, i got to smack you out of it with verbs, with using verbal. He never did it physically, but verbally. So you were sealed by means of the Holy Spirit with the guarantee of promise. 114. Who is the down payment on the release of our inheritance assets for the redemption to the praise of His glory. What does this mean? It means that God, when you believe in Christ and you're sealed with God the Holy Spirit, that is your down payment on the release of your inheritance assets. When you believe in Christ, you all have put on deposit assets. It's like it goes into an IRA. And then it goes on to say, you see, all of these, these are really for referring to eternal inheritance. So all of these inheritance assets are put on deposit for the redemption. When is the redemption? What is the redemption? What is it talking about here? It's not talking about salvation. It's talking about the resurrection. So who is the down payment on the release of our inheritance assets for the resurrection to the praise of His glory? And at the resurrection, again, you will go to the Bema. And you'll either receive these rewards or they'll remain on deposit with your name on it. You see, it's been sealed with your name on it. When you believe in Jesus Christ, all these wonderful blessings that you will receive in eternity are sealed up with your name on it. If you execute the spiritual life, you can go up to it, or actually Jesus Christ Himself, as it were, will go to the he'll be like a banker and he'll pull out all of the rewards and put them on your head and put them on your robe etc and you'll walk around like a five star general but if you did not execute the spiritual life you have not fulfilled the uh, laws of the IRA or whatever they call it today so it's still left on deposit and you can't get it out you can look at it longingly and you can look look at it with an ashamed face but you can't get it. And I imagine that every time you walk past your uh, uh, blessing on deposit, you, you, were, you would, as it were, get a knot in your stomach. And say, look what I missed out on. So this is part of inheritance as well. 
So doctrine resident in the soul is means of the inheritance of escrow blessings in time. And this is found in Psalm 1615 and Psalm 166, not 15, 165 and 166. Doctrine in your soul is the means of inheritance of escrow blessings in time. Let's look at Psalm 1615. Then we'll take a look at Psalm 16.6. And this is David. Lord, you give me stability and prosperity and you make my future secure. Now stability is of course stability of soul. And he says, and prosperity. What's the first thing that pops into your mind when you think prosperity? You think money, you think lands, you think possessions. But even in the Old Testament it wasn't referring to that. And we'll note that from verse 16. Or not 16, but verse 6. Lord, you give me stability and prosperity and you make my future secure. And David's future as a believer is secure just as all of ours. David believed in eternal security. Now in verse 6, It is as if I have been given fertile fields. It is as if I have been given fertile fields or received a beautiful tract of land. Now why does David say this? David was king of Israel. David had a castle. David at one point had ten wives. You could consider that a cursing and not a blessing though. He had beautiful tracts of fields. He had all the choice cattle. And what does he say? It is as if I have been given fertile fields. What he's talking about is it's spiritual. It's higher than all these other things we consider blessings. Much higher. The things we receive in terms of our spiritual blessings in this church age are even higher than what David received. And once you get to spiritual maturity, you will learn how to be happy in all things. You'll learn how to be happy in poverty. You'll learn how to be happy in uh, prosperity. And you better learn now, while the country's prosperous, how to be happy. So that when the country goes into a state of no prosperity, you won't fall all apart. And it can happen. We've lived in prosperity so long we almost think it could never happen. See, my generation, I'm 29 years old and there's never been one day that I didn't go without food without wanting to go without food, without making myself go without food. You know, go on a crash diet or something. If I wanted food, I could get it. Never been a day in my generation and probably never been a day in the gener in my parents' generation. Maybe there was. Uh, maybe. I don't know. But uh, in my grandparents' generation, there was something called a depression. And in the depression, people many times went without the things that we take for granted. And that wasn't so long ago in the realm of history. It could happen again. I've seen the stock market slide for two weeks straight. It's down altogether about 800 points. If it did it in one day, people would freak. But it did it over a week, what's the difference? And it keeps going down and down and down. And It might be a sign of things to come, maybe not. But we better get it right with the doctrine right now so that we can handle what's upcoming. I hope what's upcoming is victory in the war on terror and prosperity. Of course, we all would, but we never know. But we need to be prepared for both. You need to know how to be happy in prosperity and you need to know how to be happy in, in poverty and how are you ever going to learn it? From learning the Word of God. So let's look at Ephesians 1.18 now. This is also referring to the fact that do doctrine resident in the soul is a means of your inheritance blessing for time. Ephesians 1.18 
I also pray that the understanding in your stream of consciousness be enlightened. Ephesians 1.18 I also pray that the understanding in your stream of consciousness be enlightened so that you may be aware. Remember, we went over this. Awareness is the, the sixth thinking skill. Thinking skill number six. What is the absolute confidence, Elpis, of his election? And this election is referring to our calling. Our calling. Jesus Christ calls us, we don't call him. It's our calling via efficacious grace. It's election. It's the expression of the sovereignty of God for every church age believer under equal privilege. It's referring to the universal priesthood, 1 Peter 2 5 and 2 9 and also equal privilege and equal opportunity and also logistical grace. All of that out of that one word. So I also pray that the understanding and your stream of consciousness be enlightened so that you may be aware what, the tr what is the absolute confidence of his election to privilege. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance for the saints who are saints? You and me. All of us who believed in Christ are saints. And, we, and uh, we will come to know what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance for the saints. And the riches of our glory has to do with the fact that we live the protocol plan of God. Remember, we've studied the prototype that our Lord lived. Now when we get into this type of thing that's going on today that many people teach, even people out of Baraka teach it today. And that is, if you go to maturity, somehow you're going to go to material prosperity. And the only thing I have to say to them is point out that our Lord Jesus Christ lived the prototype spiritual life. And he went further in the prototype spiritual life than anyone in history ever will. And was he prosperous in terms of human prosperity, in terms of having lots of money. No. He was homeless. He even said so himself. He has no place to lay his head. So if you are looking for money by living the spiritual life, you're looking in the wrong place. Just because you grow up spiritually, you may receive logistical grace blessing and become very prosperous. And that's the will of God and that just depends on uh, your destiny in life, really. Some people are destined to be rich. Some people are destined to be poor. Some people are destined to go from poverty to riches and back to poverty and back to riches. But this is something we shouldn't worry about. And our spiritual life is not designed for us to say, I'm going to scratch God's back by living my spiritual life and He's going to scratch mine by giving me prosperity. Wrong! That's a, my pastor even used to teach this in a way. He refuted it later and said that was the stupidest thing he ever taught. He felt pretty embarrassed about teaching it. Well, you know, he had to grow up too like we all do. And you don't just receive all these what you consider blessing now by executing the spiritual life. You receive far above and beyond what you could ever ask or think. Now winning the lottery is something you can ask and think not beyond it. So you know what? I, I could say it myself, go up into this gas station up here and say, you know what? I'm living my spiritual life. 99% of Anderson isn't. Well, I deserve winning the lottery. What the heck? I'll play it. God will give it to me. I deserve it. Wrong. It's wrong thinking because that's not above and beyond what you, uh, what you can ask or think. That's exactly what you ask and think. What is be above and beyond what you ask or think is the spiritual blessings of tranquility, of spiritual self-esteem, of moving to spiritual autonomy and spiritual maturity. Look at Job, who went uh, as far as anyone in his day in the spiritual life and what he received. Boils! You've got to get away from this uh, prosperity type thinking of I'll get this and that from God if I scratch his back. No, you won't you'll get something far greater by living your spiritual life. And you'll be happy in the midst of the worst things possible going on in history. Look at our Lord Jesus Christ hanging on the cross 
he had exhibited happiness while he had nails through his hands and feet and had all our sins imputed to him and judge, he had exhibited happiness. And a lot of us could win the lottery and not have happiness at all. We'd have, re we'd have relatives coming out of the woodwork starting fights with us. First they would act nice. But if you didn't give them enough money, you would be the dirt of the town. Well, that man's so greedy. He's got so much money. And he won't even give me that boat I wanted, etc. And people get nasty. And that, that's not a happiness related to that. I'd rather have tranquility of soul. And I will anyway, no matter what relatives say. But anyway, what we're dealing with here is with an inheritance and the inheritance is far above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. Now we have three stages of inheritance. Three stages of inheritance. First of all, at the moment of salvation, we do receive an inheritance. The moment we believe in Christ, we become royal family of God. 1 Peter 2.5 and 1 Peter 2.9 make that clear. At the moment you believe in Christ, you become royal family. You ever wake up in the morning and say, Good morning, royalty. Probably not. I've done it before. <laughs> because you are. I mean, why not? Why not admit it? The reason is, is most people don't act like it. They don't act like royalty and they never even think about their spiritual life and they never even realize they are royalty. You're royalty. None of us really act like royalty, but we all are. So that's part of our what we receive at the moment of salvation. Secondly, we have a designed heritage in time, as described in Hebrews 11.7. A designed heritage in time. And you can receive that inheritance if you want, by growing in grace and in knowledge, etc., and then the third is we have a heritage forever and that's an eternal heritage. And that eternal heritage is described in 1 Peter 1, 4 through 5 which we just noted. So what inheritance does, it demands blessing from the justice of God and when you believe in Christ you adjust to the justice of God and therefore that demands blessing. And we immediately become royal family of God. Romans 8.17 8, Romans 8, says this. Romans 8.17 We will close tonight with Romans 8.17 and then tomorrow we will continue on in chapter 4. But we had to stop in chapter 4.1 for a moment because uh, we needed to learn what this inheritance was all about. Romans 8.17 And if children then heirs, namely heirs of God and also fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him, so we may also be glorified with Him. I know we just went over that a little bit ago, but it's important. Children here refers to the doctrine of sonship. Heirs refers to the doctrine of heirship. And joint heirs means we share all that Christ has by virtue of being in union with Him. And what did Christ have? A unique spiritual life that He lived in the hypostatic union. He lived the prototype. He's given it to us in the form of a protocol. So now we've been given a protocol spiritual life which Abraham didn't have, Elijah didn't have, David didn't have. Uh, none of the Old Testament saints had. And no one in the tribulation will have it. And no one in the millennial will have it. But we have it. We're in union with Christ. We share all that Christ has. Now Christ was never wealthy in terms of money while He was on the earth, but He had a wealth that is far above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. And we can have it too. But you've got to learn it. And you've got to make the Word of God number one priority to even get there. Because we noted before how our Lord even studied... I don't expect you to. We're not the Lord Jesus Christ. But we noted how he got up at 5 in the morning and studied until 9 at night and then went to sleep. And then got up and did it all over again his whole life. That was his life. Doctrine. And doctrine should be our life. 
And of course, we have responsibilities in working and family responsibilities. And if you forsake your family, you're worse than an infidel, so don't get kooky with it. I'm just telling you that you must make Bible doctrine number one and at least set some time aside in the day for it. And this is how we come to know how to that we come to know the absolute phenomenal blessings we receive by being joint heirs with Christ. And Christ is glorified and sits at the right hand of the Father. And one day somebody, don't know who it is, someone has gone so far they're going to sit at the left hand. That's true. And they're going to, and uh, they will be the highest ranking of church age believers. I imagine it will be Paul, but we don't know. We've all been given equal privilege and equal opportunity. It could be you. It could be Laura K. Tapping. It could be somebody who lives 200 years from now. It could be some un unknown person in the first century we never even heard of. Because they're invisible heroes, see. But we all have the volition to take this spiritual life as far as we want to take it. And I would advise for the sake of yourself and for the sake of this country, keep on plugging. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. We thank you that we've been given such a phenomenal inheritance in your family. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.